Did you enjoy the new intro? Messing around with three video intro makers is very fun. But yeah, I'm Baileys, and let's just jump straight into the video's topic. Or not if you suffer from thalassophobia or can't swim. We know so little about the sea. Only 5% of it has been explored and mapped. That's 5% of over 70% of the Earth's surface. We know way more about the surface of the moon than our own planet for heck's sake. Of the 5% we know, most of it is the shallows. That brings us to the unknown void of what we have no clue about. The deep sea. I've always been fascinated by the deep sea and how mysterious it is. I mean, who wouldn't like such a deep and dark mystery? Here's what we know about its deepness and its darkness, by the way. Firstly, it can be broken down into five main zones based off depth. At the top, there's the epipelagic zone. It runs until about 200 meters below the surface. It's often called the sunlight zone as it is where sunlight is best absorbed and photosynthesis occurs. This zone contains most sea life we are familiar with, including tropical reefs, tuna, sea turtles and marine mammals. Next, there's the Twilight Zone. It's a television series that started in the US in 1959. There you will find Rod Sterling and he will. Oh, I think I'm talking about the wrong Twilight Zone. All right, the ocean twilight zone, or the mesopelagic zone. Runs from 200 to 1000 meters deep, and it is the final zone where any sunlight reaches. Sunlight penetration decreases rapidly with depth, and it reaches this zone at such low intensity that photosynthesis is impossible. Animals that predominantly live here are many species of shrimp, squid, eels, and jellyfish. Now we enter total darkness. The midnight, or bathypelagic zone. It spans the 1,000 to 4,000 meter depths. Here is where creatures start to get weird. Bioluminescence becomes far more apparent as it's the only source of light available. Bioluminescence, if you didn't know, is light that is produced by living things, usually through the use of symbiotic bacteria that cause light producing chemical reactions. This is the deepest zone some cetaceans, most famously the sperm whale, hunt creatures like the giant squid. You will also find viperfish, frill sharks, umbrella octopuses, and oarfish. Deep sea gigantism is starting to occur at this depth. Many deep sea animals grow much larger than their shallow sea cousins, like the giant squid, which can get to 12 meters long, and the oarfish, which can be about 8 meters long. Big, precious babies. Not at all terrifying, but truly incredible creatures. Ooh, here's a fun fact about the giant squid. Its name in Irish is Maher Huig Vor, which means Big Mother of Suck. Ain't that neat? Do you want to know what creature here actually gives me, lover of all creatures, the shivers? The Magna Pina squid. This thing is super mysterious, but has been caught on camera several times, becoming an instant creepy viral video sensation. We know next to nothing about this thing, other than it lives at around two to three thousand meters deep. It has ridiculously long tentacles with weird elbow-like bends, is a squid, and it swims using its big fins. We don't know how big it grows, as specimens are extremely rare and are usually juveniles. The biggest one caught in camera was approximately four to eight meters long. We don't know for sure how big it gets or how it feeds, lives, or reproduces. All these unknowns unnerve, but fascinate me. It looks so alien, but it is very much real and possibly found across the world based off sightings. Speaking of terrifying, listen to the next zone's name. The Abyssal Zone, or Abyssopelagic Zone. Sounds like a powerful Magic the Gathering card or something. This zone spans the four to 6,000 meter depths. Some consider it to extend to 3,000 to 6,000 meters, so there is a wee bit of debate about it, but heck. We know nothing about it really, so all this debate is nearly arbitrary human classification. This zone makes up over 83% of the ocean alone and covers around 60% of the Earth's surface. It is typically the very deepest part of the ocean and covers much of the seafloor, with the final zone being an exception, but I'll get to that. The abyssal zone is a very stable environment in general, staying around 2-3 to three degrees Celsius all year round. Around 90% of the creatures that live there use bioluminescence. Not to see, but to lure and prey, communicate, or have raves. I don't know, neither does anyone else. It's more likely that they use it for communication or to lure and prey though. Creatures you will find here include anglerfish, gulper eels, tripod fish, dumbo octopuses, giant isopods, and thermal vent communities. 
A quick tangent on thermal vent communities, they are fascinating as they are built upon chemosynthetic organisms instead of photosynthetic ones. Animals like tube worms house microbes that can turn chemicals spewed out by the vents into food for the tube worm, for example. Other creatures can then feed on the tube worms and then others on them and so on, forming unique but relatively short food chains when compared to photosynthetic ones. Cool stuff. Aside from the vent communities, the rest of the ecology of this zone is based on detritus. Detritus is organic matter that is usually waste or debris from other organisms, including dead organisms. It falls to the depths in the form of marine snow, which makes it sound lovely despite how gross it actually is. Oh, to be a giant isopod, eating muck at the bottom of the sea. And now we reach the final zone. The Hadal Zone. This zone is made up of several deep sea trenches between the depths of 6,000 to 11,000 meters. There are around 46 Hadal Zone trenches around the world, most of which are in the Pacific Ocean. Things still live down there. The deepest known fish that live in this zone are cusk eels, which can survive up to 8,500 meters deep. Other fish that live in the shallower ends of the Hadal Zone include blobfish, snailfish and cutthroat eels. Some worms, snails and sea cucumbers are known to live way down at the bottom, but it is difficult to know to what extent as not many submersible vehicles and robots can make it that deep. The pressure down there is unfathomable to us. Many super reinforced submarines and drones collapse like squashed cans instantly under the pressure. How life of any kind survives down there is incredible. And there you have it, the five main zones of depth in the sea. It's a very general overview, but it probably, honestly, represents the vast majority of what we know about the deep sea. It's very difficult to research, so not many have bothered trying until very recently. I would love to be a part of a deep sea research team someday, but alas, most funding for that kind of research I find a bit questionable. You see, we have figured out two things about the deep sea that can be very profitable, marketable fisheries and valuable resources on or under the sea floor. Let's start with fisheries. Many countries are reliant on their oceans for food and income. Most people enjoy seafood around the world. Overfishing has become a huge problem as unsustainable amounts of sea life are removed from the oceans for profit. This has disturbed ecosystems and brought unknowable amount of creatures close to or to extinction. A lot of deep sea research is funded by fisheries to help better locate and predict where the desired marine animal will be and when. Many fish and crustaceans migrate up and down the water column during the day and night, and understanding those movements means more efficient catching. Knowing the different development stages of your quarry is also important. Going after mature adults is better, so you want to know if their behaviour and movements are different to that of juveniles. It usually is, and research shows it. The consequences of this effective exploitation only become apparent after years of doing it. We have severely impacted the fish stocks of our oceans. Depleting adult populations means that year after year there are far fewer breeding individuals to replenish the numbers. This is especially dangerous in longer lived species as it means there are long population recovery times. A well studied example of this is the Acadian redfish. It used to be extremely abundant and as a delicacy in many countries. It was overfished and when the Holland numbers became tiny, scientists were asked why. Turns out it's a slowly reproducing animal that doesn't reach sexual maturity for about six years and even then it doesn't produce as many eggs as you'd expect. Research was done to bring fishing quotas for it way down and give it time to recover. After it began to bounce back a decade later, it had to be heavily regulated so it wouldn't crash again. Many fisheries have strict quotas on how much of any species they can catch, but they are still in need of improvement in terms of sustainability. I understand that seafood is important for incomes and food, but I'd feel bad setting exploitation limits on many sea creatures that I know are going to be overfished illegally anyway because of fishing territory disputes and uncontrollable trespassing and catch number forgery. Seems like a frustrating line of work, but it's important too. Because of fishery research, we now know about the daily plankton migrations that occur in the oceans. Other sea life that feed on plankton follow these migrations and their predators follow them and so on. This means that the deep sea is extremely important for marine ecology as it hosts the vertical migration of plankton, the most important group of organisms in the sea. They are the beginning of most marine food chains, including that of the blue whale. So yeah, a very important discovery. 
The other main funding source for deep sea research is mining and oil and gas companies. Both are extremely destructive to any habitat, including the deep sea. There are lots of valuable ores under the sea floor, like gold and cobalt. Mining these would be extremely profitable, but would cause unknowable amounts of damage from destroying important habitats to unearthing other toxic compounds locked up under the seabed. Same problem with oil and gas exploration and extraction. Fun fact though, we probably would know of way fewer deep sea organisms if it wasn't for oil rigs. The famous creepy magna pina squid video was from an oil rig camera. A lot of deep sea mapping was funded by oil and gas companies too, so we get some good information out of it. Shame it is being used for the destructive fossil fuel industry. I'm sure I don't need to go into detail about the environmental horrors of fossil fuels. We've all seen oil spill photos and videos I'd say. Plus global warming and ocean acidification, fun stuff. Anyway, I'll move away from our climate change doom and talk about things I'd like to see from the deep sea in the future. One I'm sure a lot of people want to witness in their lifetime is footage of a sperm whale hunting a giant squid. Leviathan versus Kraken. A true monster movie feature. I'd also love to see what a giant squid's lifestyle is like, its behaviours and life cycle and stuff. Same goes for any other creature down there that we know so little about. Full BBC David Attenborough series on the deep sea and the lives of its inhabitants, please. I'd also love to see more deep sea coral reef videos in the future. Ireland has a huge deep sea reef that I'm sure is bustling with activity. Many deep sea reefs, including the Irish one, are shark nurseries. Loads of shark species give birth in the safety of the deep sea. Finding out where these important places are would be key to shark conservation worldwide. I know it's probably never going to be fully explored, but I really want to find out more about the deep sea in my lifetime. I don't want to live through the destruction of it due to humans and then never find out what lived down there and how. Who knows? Our continued destruction of the oceans could lead to the awakening of some all-powerful deep sea force, like Godzilla, Cthulhu or Kyogre or something. That would sort us out fairly quickly and would be a good way to finish 2020. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the video. Is it obvious I love the deep sea yet? See you in the next one.